Hello everyone. So today, this is uh, Orhan Ergun. Today we will discuss data centers, data center networking with um, in LinkedIn with Sean and Jeff. Jeff, probably you know him anymore, but uh, I want to say welcome to Sean first. Sean, welcome. Thank you, uh, Orhan and Jeff. So, uh, uh, do, do, for the, for the audio, need... introduce please yourself. Absolutely. Sean Zadi, I lead the network engineering for LinkedIn. I've been involved in networking since 90s, um, familiar with, you know, token ring, IPX, SPX, frame relay to current technologies of hyperscale data centers and cloud network. Okay, so throughout the wide way uh, discussion, uh, I will tell many things about him. He just didn't say, but uh, for those especially who know me from the CCDE and CCD community, he is another CCDE, old CCDE person, I should say. Uh, just as a side note. Also, we have a uh, usual, my co host, Jeff Tanstra here. Jeff, welcome. Hey, guys. Great to be here. Welcome, Sean. So, hey, as Jeff. you know, guys, as you know, data center, data center routing uh, are one of our very highly interested topic. So uh, I did many session actually uh, with Jeff. We talked about a lot of routing protocol, especially uh, Rift, VGP plus SPF, uh, 7938, lots of stuff uh, in this channel, but uh, specifically in real life network. Today we will start uh, talking about the LinkedIn's data center network and hopefully uh, in the future also, uh, not very, far future, but uh, soon, hopefully, we will discuss backbone design as well. But today, let's start first with the data center. Sean ex will explain uh, history and the trends of the hyperscale, massively scale data centers. And we will talk about the disaggregation. So how LinkedIn, they are basically uh, doing the disaggregation, white box, those kind of things in their network. Plus, uh, he will explain some data center control planes, some routing protocols, etc. throughout the discussion. Uh, we might be asking some questions to understand more what LinkedIn is doing. So let's start. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Orhan. Um, we have, let's move to the slide that uh, starts with the traditional hierarchical network design. Um, in the past, um, all the network designs were kind of similar around specific platforms, whether it was a campus network or data center network. Um, it, it was very similar in terms of having that, you know, chassis, big chassis switch in the center and having the access aggregation and core. Uh, catalyst switches were definitely dominated in the space. The original 5,000 and 6,000 series, uh, series came based on technology that uh, was acquired from Crescendo Communication. Then there were there were like 900 and 2800 catalysts from uh, Grand Junction, and then 3000 from Calpana in '94. Foundry was uh, in the game. Uh, they introduced their gigabit Ethernet in '97, and then Layer Three switching in the same year or a year after that. Um, extreme Northal Brocade, and everybody has their had their own uh, chassis switch. The idea was that you you're gonna have this multi-service chassis. Uh, mostly uh, 6500 in the center of the network by cisco and then you you would bring the services service modules in that the the type of the traffic in 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 those traditional uh, data centers were north south or south north traffic model which is there's a client behind uh, outside the network the traffic comes uh, goes through the core switch, goes to the server, is being processed, and traffic is sent back to to the client. Um, so the traffic flow was mostly between the client and server coming through the north and being processed at south, and the intelligence remained at the core. Um, you, you could process different things at the core, like you could get uh, firewall services or intrusion detection service or load balancers and process it. Um, at the core or aggregation layer or, or later on service module. But the traffic had to flow th uh, through that uh, processing or service module uh, uh, component. Moving on to, to the next generation is, um, is the earlier adoption of 
similar thing was was mostly around okay you're gonna have a production network you're gonna have a, a, a great fabric for your data center staging environment but these were typically handled by separate topologies se separate isolated networks they had their own you know core distribution and access top of rack switches and then um, the, uh, you could implement firewalls in a stateful manner or a stateless uh, depending on you know scale as as a perimeter gateway that you can control who's accessing to what environment and what are the rules or uh, act holes between those environments um, that introduced a lot of challenges when the traffic got larger and larger so the core routers had to keep up with the capacity of network between environment and also inside the environment and also had to uh, process a lot of things by uh, soft switching, which, which delayed a lot of traffic distribution in the network. So traffic required to pass through middle boxes multiple times to be processed in order, in order to work with different environments and inside the environments. So to add Does to that, that uh, most of networking back then was layer two, so you would start routing from the aggregation layer which led to use of spanning trees and half of the capacity was blocked due to spanning tree loop prevention, which made things only worse. That is an extremely important point, Jeff. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, la layer two or uh, uh, any you know, spanning tree network war is, uh, wants to dominate a, a loop-free kind of topology. So it started blocking stuff until there's no loop. Whereas in L3, you, you're gonna add as more as possible to, to your link capacity so that you can use it with ECMP technology. So you're gonna burn a lot of van uh, waiting have capacity using L2 technologies in those kind of networks. And of course the processing on the access switches were very limited to, to run the routing protocols at that time. So for Moving comparison, on. your CPU on your phone today is more powerful than early CPUs on the access layer switches. They were really, really slow and little. Absolutely. Moving on to the next generation, uh, which um, I like to call it, well, it, it is a common name as well, web scale data centers. They were created around this massive distribution of traffic, which is mostly east-west. Uh, distributed computing introduced a lot of challenges to the network so that you had to handle at scale uh, um, gigabits or terabits of traffic due to microservices distribution that is not very predictable and you know services can talk to each other in a, in a very random uh, non-deterministic way completely distributed then you have grid compute AI machine learning big data offline compute that need to work over the Fabric and also communicate with the you know back end and front end at some point. Um, then you you also see that um, in order to improve the compute performance and distributed computing, you you have to improve the I/O throughput and the latency of the network, and provide uh, growth and scale uh, in a continuous manner. You provide bare, bare metal services to your site reliability engineers and your developers so that they can interact with the bare metal with high performance, have you know unlimited access to the memory and CPU so that scale the application for uh, web users. The, the next one is the move to from web scale to the cloud networks, which is, um, has similar properties, but it's mostly focused on providing compute on demand as opposed to bare metal services. So you, you, you run your application, then you can scale your application based on resources that you need so that you can utilize more compute, uh, ramp it up and ramp it down based on the, uh, the IO and throughput that you need. Um, you see a lot of containerization so that you can make everything look similar uh, and then you have orchestration engines on top so that you can manage it. You, you, you see reduction in number of hardware SKUs as opposed to the previous generation that you could te technically bring any uh, bare metal system and, and connect it to your network. You, you want some standardization so that you can orchestrate and manage the, these compute nodes. And then you see uh, storage being disaggregated so that you can bring compute in parts of the network where you can have access 
to the data um, remotely. Uh, there is this trend of uh, a trend of requirement around micro segmentation so that you can have multiple tenants. You can um, have segmentation for warding plane or provide overlay so that you can move workloads from one location to another without changing any properties that is required by the compute. So what we're seeing here is that the, the intelligence that was in the previous slide uh, at, the, at the core or core switches and those you know load balancing firewall and those functionalities has to move to the edge so that it can cap up, uh, keep up with the pace of the network and the throughput as well as uh, being able to scale horizontally uh, over time. So you see a lot of FPGAs or smart NICs to handle security and encryption at the host level, provide some hardware acceleration to improve the throughput. You don't want to soft switch your stuff or, or process it uh, in the middle of the network by CPU. You want wire speed throughput. And then there, there's this discussion of um, network function virtualization versus virtual network function or BNF that as opposed to sending or steering traffic through middle boxes to be able to process. Um, you, you want to bring those services as close to the edge and the compute so that they can process it right away. And you don't need to steer the traffic inside the network, inside your topology. Uh, and of course, getting rid of all the middle boxes that need to intercept you know, TCP or, or headers or payload, uh, remove one of remove all of those firewall appliances, uh, load uh, balancers and those kind of things and moving, replacing those bug centric uh, networking with some some more uh, application oriented business intent centric uh, approaches that you, know, you can you can call a software defined network where where the network uh, gets out of the way and provide that flexibility and programmability for the application and processes to take advantage of all the resources that they can. Uh, let's stop here for a second and kind of summarize what has changed. We moved from three-tier architecture to leaf spine architecture. So around 2009, to my memory, Google has presented how they are building their data center. And this is when other people started to pay attention. And together with overall virtualization, we went from application per server to VMs and eventually to containers. We really required equidistant access to every application because applications got more and more distributed over the fabric. This is the only way to scale. Another important point was if you want to scale in three tier scenario, you need to buy either new line cards or larger chassis. In leaf spine architecture, you just add more spine so you scale out horizontally, which is a very important point when your network is growing twice every year. Yeah, but yeah, architecture yeah, yeah. choice is scale up versus scale out, but not for everyone that is good thing. So here we are talking massive scale. That's the point we should make. And uh, one of the probably important points we need to tell. Not everyone needs this uh, scale out horizontal architecture, but vertical and even couple just one or two chassis box might be providing entire of your needs for your data center as well. Today, this is special talk and the special architecture we are talking about. But practically, if you remember 6500 in the system implemented firewall load balancer, I mean, you had blades for pretty much anything, which created very nice way because your uh, aggregation layer was the centralization layer and the first layer to have but if you needed to scale out and you run out of uh, line cards, ports, capacity on this large box, you had to forklift to buy a new box. So when we started to disaggregate and distribute the services closer to workloads, mostly being load balancing, firewalling, suddenly you wouldn't need this larger boxes because the more distributed your deployment is, the less capacity per unit you need which was another point kind of to start building more distributed architectures. Sure, sure. So, but uh, those are, again, architectural choices, we can get more device, more device to manage, probably uh, more device to manage might be seen as cons, but on the other side also, when there's a failure, that failure impact, less reduced will not be huge as well. So 
yes, uh, throughout this discussion, this architectural discussion, again and again, we will make. Yeah, good, good yeah, point. Th this is a very interesting. I, I agree with both points here. Um, I, the, the old RFC of uh, 1925, the 12 networking tools is talking about no matter how much you know CPU process or resources you have is never enough. Uh, this is uh, exactly the same thing here. Uh, your network is never large enough when you're working at scale and you have to constantly uh, scale it. And the, 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 the only way that you can do it is to, to have an architecture that you can increase and grow over time so that you don't have to go back and change all the elements every time that you want to upgrade. And that's one of the problem with uh, specific architectures that rely mainly on uh, specific, you know, chassis switches. And we have we have some slide about it. Uh, uh, and, and and the point about th this is not necessarily a recipe for everyone is absolutely not. It depends sure. on your uh, mileage. The slide, slide we are looking at also shows beautiful thing called pot or point of delivery. This allows you to bring single unit of deployment that is built and designed a particular way. May you wish to deploy something that's another way faster, optimized towards other workloads. You build another pod and you interconnect it in standardized way. This is how networks like LinkedIn and Largers are dealing with fast deployments and replicating what has already been built, designed, formalized, documented. Thank you, Jeff. I uh, definitely, uh, one of the things that we talk about is that you definitely have to model your network in such a way that is uh, able to scale and uh, make it a cookie cutter templatized design so that you can one, have good predictability over the behavior of the network because the topology is known. And the other one is that you can easily automate it because you're building the same building blocks, you know, every time that you're growing your network. We don't need to re-engineer or you know come up with a new tooling every time that you want to change or add to your network. Moving on to the next slide, we have uh, I put some uh, guiding principles for infrastructure architecture at scale. Um, one of the things that we have to think about when we are designing a network at scale, uh, cloud scale or uh, or web scale, uh, the, it is very important for the network architect, which is I think the main. Uh, audience of this discussion to have a philosophical approach to the business needs. Um, have a clear vision and mission for why you're building that infrastructure to, su to serve what purpose. Because network on its own um, is nothing other than just a bunch of devices connected to each other, but network should be designed and architected in mind with, with the application requirements and how it wants to serve. Uh, or its users, applications, or services. And when you, those business needs are different, definitely you, you, you may end up with different kind of architecture or design, but you have to have a good justification of why certain decisions are, are made or being made in your environment. Um, the other thing is, Previously, as, as, as network engineers, uh, some of us, uh, if not most, were trained by certification programs that teach you how to operate certain vendor, uh, which is completely understandable. But at, at some point, at some scale, you need to break out and unchain yourself from vendor locking so that you can use open standards and bring different good things from different technologies or different vendors and be able to connect them together for your own purposes. So it's important to own your architecture in a way that makes sense for you, as opposed to buy the complete end-to-end -end architecture from somewhere that uh, it may have good things or unnecessary stuff for you and could be uh, a, a complete black box for you to, to tweak. Uh, in order to, um, you won't be able to reiterate or change it or, or customize it based on your need. So it's, mm -hmm. it's good to be able to break that complexity complexity to a level that you're comfortable with. It is, it is very important what you said. I, I would just ask why you um, you don't want to be vendor locked in. Is it cost purpose? Actually, cost might be another thing, but uh, you are saying there might be multiple functions uh, which we don't need and because we don't need but still we are maybe paying for that 
So we want to customize it. We don't want to have whatever we don't want and so on and so forth. So it's important. But uh, other than that, uh, making customize any other thing like cost, maybe mean any other thing? Uh, okay. Why you don't want cost, cost is definitely there. And I, and I put it as the last uh, bullet point. Uh, uh, cost is definitely important on scale. Uh, when you talk about the economy of scale, when you're talking about, you know, uh, millions of bare metal servers or uh, 10,000 or, or more of switches, you need to look at the cost. And uh, that is important in order to survive in the business. Um, cloud companies are saving billions of dollars every year using different technologies, including, for example, uh, open computing Facebook, saving a ton of money for Facebook because of that open architecture. And then, then you can source it from multiple channels or, or then something like COVID happens, when you have problem with logistics from one vendor, you, you have the ability to channel it from different places and bring it to your network in a timely fashion. Whereas if you're limited to certain merchant uh, uh, silicon or, or, or technology, then you're doomed. You cannot grow unless you, you bring another uh, different design and engineering to your to your network, which is going to take much longer time. So it's important to use those open technologies and be able to control what's happening inside your infrastructure. But more than anything, you, you, I think you talked about the simplification is extremely important. You, you don't need those features. And sometimes you need features that are not available, which is a much bigger problem. For example, back in a day, we wanted to do some um, basic ACL stuff through BGP. At, the, at its time, made sense. Maybe we, you know, we don't do it right now. Uh, we wanted to have flow spec on the mm -hmm. on the top of rack switches so that we can quarantine some uh, bad behavior from uh, cert certain applications. And well, if if you go to if you have a Linux, you just go and you know grab Bird and install it, and you're done. But if you're uh, using you know X OS, you have to work with your business unit convince them that you have this volume of uh, purchases, please add this to your roadmap and wait for quarters. And then they, they have to see if it makes business justification on their side to put it in the roadmap and implement it for you. Uh, it is important to, to be able to move fast and tweak stuff and bring it in your control uh, in a timely fashion. And it's, it's, it's great to run Linux on your uh, network devices, which you're gonna talk about it. But more than that, it's about owning your network in terms of access to the code to the level that makes you comfortable and it make you uh, enable you to move fast. Hopefully people now uh, get this point because this is very important question. Why LinkedIn, why other people are building their own uh, hardware, software, etc. So they want to control, they want to manage and not 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 only the computation, etc. the cost as well, many things. That's right. But uh, one thing, yes, uh, because of scale, they can do this. Scale well, let's is decompose the business part of it. There are companies who treat their network as cost center. They're okay with single vendor, vendor lock in, as long as they get the cost under control. They might go into open networking, but again, it's going to be mostly cost driven. So they're trying to get same basic functionality for less money. And Hyperscalers are not on this side. On this side of things, network is your most valuable asset. If network isn't working, nothing ends working and your applications are not going to work. So owing your destiny is very important. Ability to deliver features, so as Sean explained, is extremely important. And this is where you start looking into disaggregation of not only software of hardware, which is natural. You want to decouple life cycles of hardware and software from each other and cherry tick cherry pick the best ones. Now you can also look, I want to run BERT for flow spec, but I prefer OSPF implementation from FRR, for example. It gives you ability again to choose the best part and bring them together so they meet your business requirement. If you're large enough and have good deployment and uh, part of the company that actually can work on routing, such as LinkedIn, for example, you can actually build your own stuff. You can build your own protocols. You can build your own extensions to the protocols because you are large enough to run it in your network only, and you will immediately increase quality of your network. You will be able to build things you couldn't before.
Thank you. Um, yeah, one thing that I want to point out here is that the intent is not to reinvent the wheel or you know come up with a you know fancy project just to design a new switch hardware or you know switch software. These are the things that vendors are actually doing it much better than anybody else because they are in this business for long time. It's more about the ability to customize it based on your needs and simplify it as much as possible. So it matches your scale. And also you don't want to get those bugs or exploits that are not even relevant to your network, but they are part of your code because the code is heavy in order to be a general purpose code to support a variety of different customers. And you don't want that heavy code necessarily in, in your system because you do some specific stuff that are maybe 10% or 50% of the code base or feature base of that product. The other part of it is, and this is something very common that we, we see um, network engineers of, of, of today are really good in terms of knowing how to interact with the product uh, uh, in terms of features or, or design that specific platforms. But they, they are not really, it's very important to know your hardware in and out, that what kind of you know, silicon you're using in your network or what, what kind of hardware you want to qualify for future of your network. Uh, know your wire speed performance, know where you want to do, you know, uh, fast path processing hardware, where it's okay to send stuff to the CPU for a slow path. Uh, what are your TCAM and memory scale if you want to, for example, uh, handle the internet routing table in, in a merchant silicon? Does it support all of the prefixes or you need to, you know, aggregate? Uh, or, or how many echoes you can push to, to the edge of the network if you have to. Those properties of the hardware play a key role in your, in your architecture and capabilities. Because if hardware is not capable of doing that, you're going to be in trouble at scale. You have to push these things to, to somewhere like a general purpose CPU, which is going to slow you down in terms of performance and latency and other things. Uh, I think um, that's also one of the key decision factor, whether you go with a vertically integrated solution from a vendor are, when you are pretty much protected from overloading your fast pass, they won't allow you to download stuff that shouldn't, if they do it well, in many cases actually would. And going completely open, interacting with something like uh, hardware ASIC SDK, so really understanding hardware details. So before you move into well, another direction, you need to understand whether you have people who are capable of doing this and what are you going to gain by looking into hardware SDK versus an interacting with high level APIs, for example, provided by Sai in Sonic or provided by SwitchD on Cumulus. So something that's higher level and abstract semantics of different vendors. It's a very important business points that you need to understand and discuss when you decide to go into build it yourself or build it with community or buy from someone else. Exactly. The, the, the other thing that you notice at scale is that because you're going to run thousands and thousands of uh, network elements, um, you, you're going to be ready for operational challenges that comes along with it. You're going to get a lot of events alert network convergence events, packet loss across the network, uh, it is extremely important to be able to measure and observe what's happening in network via different ways of you know, having telemetry uh, on the boxes, uh, outside the boxes on the, on, the, on the end host, have visibility over how TCP is performance, uh, performing, how the network is uh, handling the traffic, uh, simple things like buffer utilization, interface utilization to to things that are more abstract like you know head of line blocking and other stuff you need to uh, and it's it's very common thing that we say in operation because you constantly need to keep up with the alert to to kind of uh, uh, noise uh, uh, ratio as well as being able to only process the information that are actionable just notification on, on their own are not you know are not very uh, helpful, but you want to take action and you know escalate it or automatically remediate it. You have to and um, uh, you have to measure it. You cannot manage what you cannot measure, and right. you cannot measure if you don't 
track things properly. So you need to know what, what are the important stuff that you want to track in your network. And telemetry is another interesting point when you start looking at how do you operate, how do you interact with the system. You go low level, you are with vendor. You use Broadcom, you'll use IFA. You use Mellanox, you'll use what just happened. You use Barefoot, you will use in. So all different capsulation, different formats, and uh, you will need to build some consumption model for this information that's really vendor dependent. You go to completely other site, you choose a vendor, Cisco, Arista, Juniper. Again, you are consuming telemetry that in many way vendor proprietary. Being in between, using something like Sonic, gives you ability to get normalized data where the semantic data is abstracted, whether it's Broadcom, Mellanox, or someone else. Data is normalized and provides your ability to consume this data in normal way over common API and then build your business logic on top that does something with this data. Again, very important point when you think, should I build it myself? Should I buy it? Should I have a partner that helps me? So you, you mentioned about the uh, measurement. Uh... And you said also head of line blogging, etc. I just wonder, is microburst applicable for your network? And are you measuring it? Tom? Microburst. Uh, we are definitely to some extent, depending on you know how how short that burst is. We definitely uh, have some threshold for reporting those issues. Some of them, especially microburst and micro loops, are not very actionable. By the time that you can, you know, take action, alert is generated, you know, reach to the somebody that look into it. Those events maybe are already gone. The only thing that you can do is to to look at the, your capacity numbers and then forecast more capacity so that you can handle that, or or have some um, ECN or you know congestion um, mechanism that can you know uh, deal with this or prioritization based on application which is mostly, um, it is not very common other than storage use cases that you don't want to you know, lose the storage packets. But uh, most of the hyperscale data centers that I know, they, they don't do advanced QS just because you're running thousands and thousands of services that it is really hard to classify which one is more important than the other one, just looking at those properties. Uh, you, you have to look into, for example, what kind of payload they are carrying, for what a specific use case and then apply QS and network does not seem to be the right place anymore for that. You usually do those, do, do those QS prioritization at the application between front end and back end and then measure the QPS or you know back, uh, back off thresholds. Uh, network does not seem to be the right place for for that detail kind of you know actions and makes it complicated because it's it's kind of is not visible to end-to-end -to -end, uh, application processes. Uh, we, we would like TCP and layer four to take care of flow control and those kind of things. I or think TCP. QS is really, really complex and vendor dependent. So from personal experience, we are trying to build young model for QS and routing working group. It took us years, literally years, to converge on common terminology, common behaviors of different QS systems and different vendors. It's really complex technology. So this, this this one it seems uh, our usual trade off. So we don't have in in your architecture quite of service there, uh, and uh, comes to trade off of uh, throwing bandwidth versus the quite of service. And you've seen it as complex and probably also performance tax will be there. So that's why when there's a congestion, better to uh, put more capacity. Okay. You have to, yeah, yeah. You could use your capacity more efficiently. You could do CMP better. You could move to weighted yeah. CMP. Yeah. There's some advanced feature on ASIC that give you ability to dynamically change load distribution, hash and bucket skiing. So there are many things you could do to do it better. You just need to understand why, and you need to be technical savvy enough to actually implement this. And actually, we're getting a little bit closer to the discussion about open fabric and traffic management in the data center. But uh, the point that, uh, Jeff, you brought up about QS being extremely vendor dependent because it, it works with the queues and memories and in the hardware. And there are you know so many ways that you know different vendors implement it. 
uh, on top of that, the point about monitoring uh, is vendor dependent, obviously, because of the, the features that vendor provide. And configuration is also the same thing. It is extremely vendor dependent, depending on you know what kind of capabilities that vendor is providing. Uh, if uh, you look at you know QoS monitoring configuration, you have to invest in that abstraction layer. Whether it's you know Open Config Plus, some other things in Sonic that you, you mentioned, that you can make it simplify uh, to to the lowest common denominator at least, and then then you can use some of those features uh, when they are needed in a more specific way. But you you want to have this global optimum kind of network design as opposed to locally optimize it for a specific implementation because it's, 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 it's going to take forever. At this point, by the way, just let me remind you, if you like this discussion and if you want to see more between the uh, three of us, so please like the video and also uh, subscribe to the channel. At this moment, uh, I want to take one question. Actually, is asking, how do you upgrade your huge network when new technology comes into play, like segment routing or any other technology, let's say? Your chipset, your device architecture are not ready to accept those technology. Wow. So it is a very good question, by the way. Um, it is not a common practice to go back and change your network in, at web scale companies. We're always building capacity 24-7. We're always adding to the capacity, right? Uh, any new technology that we introduce, and it's it's very common in, in, in a cloud provider, you, you're going to introduce in the new builds. So all the new pods are going to have this new functionality and feature. The problem with that is that if, if you want to, you know, use those features in the previous builds, you're limited to to certain functionality. But that's the only way that you can scale. Uh, going back and retrofitting stuff going to take uh, a lot of time and uh, expenses. Uh, but when it comes to fabric, that's that's a much easier. I, uh, we've, we've done it in LinkedIn many times that we, it's like open heart surgery. When we were moving from the first generation of you know, data center network, we, we had to move the spanning three from one to another, it was MIST. And then we had to move the VRRP and then change the OSPF, change the lags so that they go through you know, one of the posts out of four or out of two, and then change, completely change the, the, the switch, bring a new switch up, and then put the traffic back to that one fail back, and then upgrade the other one. Uh, at the top of the hierarchy, it's much easier to do. When it goes to the access switches and servers, um, yeah, it is definitely a very time-consuming uh, activity. However, in terms of automation, we, we have tools that uh, move the traffic via BGP from certain part of the network and automate the operating system at scale across switches during maintenance window or, or during live events. If, if, if you have you know, graceful restart capabilities so that uh, AC can continue forwarding the packet and then upgrades itself. And when it comes back, it can learn stuff from the forwarding plane and then put it in the in the FIV or SWSS in case of Sonic, which is, uh, I think, introduced in Sonic Release 2.2. is a pretty cool feature. Um, I don't know if I address the, the, the question, but uh, generally, in, in short, uh, changing everything uh, to, to a new technology across the board is something close to, um, let's say, improbable for, for any networking company. So okay. more generalized version of what you just said, commonly in large companies, upgrades are happening as per pod. And top or top of fabric, super spine, super, super spine is the layer that provides common NNI across different pods. So this is how you connect the pods and you abstract the different technologies used. So you would use something that's common across all pods. So you deploy pod, for example, with segment routing, it's a new pot. You don't carry your legacy. And Sean brought a very important point. You don't want to carry a legacy. You want to deploy new technology on, if possible, new pot, use common interconnection layer at top of fabric and build out this way. It gives you ability to innovate at speed you need. It gives you ability to hide and abstract new technologies, new complexities come up with new technology. Actually, this is uh, 
traditional migration path, but probably this one without the maybe showing, drawing, etc., was not that clear. Maybe we can uh, also uh, provide in any other, other future discussion that path as well. Okay. Yeah, so we are 40 minutes into discussion. Perfect. I think we should move on. Yes. Let's move on. Please comment. Um, sure. Um, the the other part of this discussion is around when you're working at a large scale, it is important to go back and rethink about your approaches once in a while and see uh, what are the ways that you can make it more efficient. Um, for example, you you see across the board, you know, a lot of companies are working on creating some open standard and adding or um, advocating people to join their community so that they can build this uh, stronger user base, which goes to the to the benefit of the economy of a scale. The more if if you can bring you know million um, server units that can use a specific kind of NIC or advancement in FPGA, then you can bring the price lower based on the additional volume. And that's 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 how you see that the cloud companies save billions of dollars every year in their infrastructure by just looking and rethinking what are the areas that I can economically also scale uh, my cost uh, to, to the lowest possible margins. Uh, one of those things is, you know, use of the commodity market uh, x86, which you know, back in the day we had uh, Sun Microsystems and mainframes, and then everybody disaggregated to okay, bring your uh, CPU, and then you can run a Linux environment of your choice, um, and you're not locked into you know a specific kind of solution end to end. As well as the same thing that is happening in routing, that you can you know have a router that. Uh, you, you can get the silicon from the from the various manufacturers and then build your own switch or router on top of it with uh, very common standard hardware and run Linux on top of it, which we're gonna talk about. But cost is definitely very important when it comes to scale. Uh, the trade-off is always between cost and functionality, one way or another. So I think we are at a very interesting point in networking industry where functionality is becoming more important than cost. So fungible, Pensander, all the smart NIC or DPU development shown this way, because all the price difference between regular NIC and DPU is order of magnitude, right? But Amazon actually figured out very early that you have to have your own silicon at networking level. This is how Naputra acquisition came in. This is what we know today as uh, Nitro architecture is their own hardware that takes care or took care eventually started with networking now taking care of security storage and many other things so we are seeing more and more customized hardware at networking layer but at the host layer not on the switches so the role of switches is still to provide wire speed very very fast networking but more advanced features security features more advanced encapsulation, think about Genif and all variable length stuff that's going in, is definitely moving to the servers and the special hardware that used to be just simple NIC that would move packets from in and out server. Yes, and that is extremely important as, as you mentioned, uh, Jeff, uh, because of those lack of flexibilities in silicon or network, that's why we, we are seeing that more, more networks are, are designed around basic IP fabric or some standardization around how do you want to encap your packet? And that's why we see you know less progress in terms of introduction of SRV6. Um, even though we you know we have some good news uh, recently in in terms of adoption, uh, one of the things that for example Barefoot Network was trying to solve with P4 to give you that programmable ASIC that you can you know match the packet header and process it in the hardware um, because then VMware uh, acquired uh, Nicera and they wanted to have you know, a VXLAN across VM so that you, you abstract the host and don't change the IP address and bring it from one location to another. Uh, I think development of VXLAN took several years in order to, to, to be able to do it in hardware. And that's the lesson learned. That's why we're, we're keeping the, uh, we talked about the move the intelligence from the core, from the network, make it 
keep it as simple as possible and bring that intelligence to the edge. And then your point about FPGAs and you know processing at, at, at the compute level that they can do it at wire speed. Yeah, and uh, the more you distribute, it's same as with applications. The more you distribute, the less speed per unit you need. Same goes to this kind of features. It's much easier to build more advanced functionality programmability at 100 gig branches. on the server than at 24 tera on switch and silicon. So it's very natural from engineering perspective as well to do it this way. Absolutely. Shall okay. we move? Let's do it. Um, quick slide on what is our vision when we're thinking about introducing a new uh, technology to our infrastructure. We think about usually three things uh, to make it simplified: uh, the ability to disaggregate, so getting you know one complex system and breaking it down into hardware and software, so you can you know upgrade the software, upgrade the hardware independently from each other, or mix and match across different hardware, the same software. Uh, which ultimately gives you that control that uh, we need in order to be able to grow fast and move fast you need that level of control and less dependency on on the things that are outside your control um, ability to scale out uh, whatever solution that you're putting right now you should think about the scale of at least 10x so if, you, if you're designing a network for 100,000 bare metal you should think about 1 million bare metal or, or, or think about you know much more traffic because it happens super fast. We, we uh, across LinkedIn, you know, we saw 50% uh, year over year growth in terms of infrastructure. So you're it's, uh, it's always too late to to think about you know what's next. You have to think ahead of time uh, and, and 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 be prepared and ready for that. Uh, and the other part of it is the since uh, you talked about cookie cutter template model based networking it is important to have some building blocks that are similar across the board. They look exactly like each other, but then you have software functionalities that you can go and program it the way that you want, as opposed to go to the cabinet and remove the switch and put a new gear. Um, that improves the innovation and velocity and make your network simple yet programmable to the, to the, to the extent that uh, you want to take advantage of it. Um, of course, you know, uh, the, the trends, I put some trends over there. You, you hear a lot about these, you know, buzzwords or marketing words, but these are important to important to, to, to understand. Use of merchant silicon, uh, cloud technology, the, the, the economy of a scale of the more people buy something, gets cheaper over time. And uh, that's why people are, you know, uh, cloud companies are investing in silicon uh, for machine learning, for AI and other things. Uh, the programmability of data center and DevOps and automation practices because you want to build a lot of switches. You have to automate these things so that you can build faster and also have consistency and integrity in terms of implementation and have a proper QA when you hand it off to application owner that everything is actually working because you don't want to go back and fix those problems or wiring or BGP or those kind of things. So you have to have this end-to-end -end automation system in place to be able to keep up with the scale. So when we're designing a, a, a network or technology, you have to have this uh, in mind. Moving on to the next one. I'd is... like to reemphasize your phrase, simple yet programmable. There are golden words. You should know there is no such thing as finite programmability. There's limited number of lookups you could do within particular time, limited amount of space to put your microcode in. It's very important to keep things simple so you can still program them and still be able to send traffic at line rate without re-looping it in some technologies, without going into slow paths, without doing something that we shouldn't be doing. So keep it simple and programmability will be on top. But uh, let's not forget, complexity always will be there. We are trying to avoid unnecessary complexity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the com complexity is one of those, you know, conversation can get tricky. And I think uh, Jeff and Russ for the book on complexity. Uh, it's one of those things that can be used in any argument by engineers. 
and it's it, it could be subjective to a certain extent that anybody can use it if you don't like a design you can call it unit complex so it's important to have some uh measurable um, or, or some uh, data around how do you quantify complexity and that's one of the things that we have in a slide why do i you know talk about chassis switches to be complex uh, and we're hoping that it's, it's somewhat objective than subjective um, uh, in this case so one of the things that you know we 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 noticed was that we had this um, dark failures that we had no idea what's happening packets were dropping inside a switch which is not open to you to understand and then you have to go through you know tag and then open cases and uh, apparently it was so complex that i had to go through multiple tier of engineers or around multiple hours to view the you know crash uh, results and other things to understand what is really happening inside this black box um the large chassis are are created in a way that you don't worry about anything you just put it in your network go to sleep you're not going to get a call. You have enough redundancy inside the chassis. You have dual supervisor. You have multiple line cars. You have you know multiple fabric cars, and your hands off. It's kind of you know total solution for you. We take care of it. Don't worry about it. But the problem with with that is that um, when something goes wrong, it goes drastically wrong, and it takes a long time not only to fix it but also it has this blast radius in terms of failure because it's a critical piece, it's expensive, you want to take advantage as much as you, you, you can, um, and it's designed for resiliency and reliability in such a way that it wants to provide 100% availability. With that, because this is an extraordinary expectation from a box, comes extraordinary complexity. You have, they have to have a state between supervisor uh, engines and share it and then provide in-service uh, soup upgrades, um, provide non-stop forwarding, grace for restart. Uh, a lot of these complex things that, you know, chassis switches should be ever, the more that you add, invest in resiliency of the box, the more bugs, the more fragility you also bring to that uh, robust, yet fragile, they, they, they come together. Um, so adding all those features can create more trouble for you, as this applies to, to code as well. The more code that you write, the more bugs you're gonna get out of it. Um, the, the other thing about, we, we talked about blast radius. Uh, it, we, were, we were seeing that, you know, chassis switches were doing a good job most of the times during the failovers. But one of the things that we noticed that failbacks were tricky. When a you know, switch goes down, everything is fine, everything converge. But then when a switch comes back up, it gets complicated between switches, they fight over uh, failback scenarios, or, or they come up, you know, promise PGP, and then you notice that, you know, for example, the, the, the line curve was not really ready to, to forward the packets uh, because uh, you, you don't really, you, you want to have control actually which line card and which part of network gonna come back up first. It makes it really complex as well in, in failback scenarios, as opposed to just maybe wait, everything converge and then bring it back up. Uh, a lot of you know, network events rely on uh, electrical signal or line card activity to, to enable forwarding back, which is out of the control of the chassis itself. The other thing is the CP of these boxes is, is uh, very limited for that number of ports that they support, um, which is understandable. But um, over the course of time, we realized that it's really hard to scale network purely based on big chassis switches. Uh, you have to go through long maintenance windows and then you know, completely change the chassis and line cards and everything to, to scale your network. By the way, very fast, uh, let me explain, because not everyone may be from design background, uh, robust yet fragile. In the basic design, we have this concept called robust yet fragile. But whenever you are trying to make something robust, actually, from some aspect, you are trying to make robust. And from other aspect, you are making it fragile. I think uh, it's like a trade-off. So if you are trying to make something secure, you probably affect you are making it more fragile for the 
user experience or performance, okay? Or if you are trying to uh, make it uh, faster, probably you are affecting the stability of network, this kind of thing, okay? Another thing, blast reduce, we talked about blast reduce, basically when something, some link or node fails, how it will affect uh, the user's traffic, network traffic. So if this trusty box fails, uh, it might be affecting maybe huge amount of traffic or millions of uh, customers, let's say in the service provider back home. Uh, on the other side, if you are talking very small uh, boxes, which we will show you now, uh, blast reduce the effect network traffic wise, the user number of user wise uh, will be much less. Let's understand the concept. That's why scale up, scale up. So scale up, uh, blast reduce will be less because more devices and each device's duty function uh, expectation is less. Okay. Let's move. Yeah. So uh, what you see here is not unique to networking. That's exactly how software evolution is progressing as well. So when we think about non-stop routing, which definitely has the crown of complexity, it's nothing else that complete stateful synchronization between active and standby route processors. In terms of so being on vendor side, it might take you a month to build BGP feature, but will take you additional months to build all the NSR synchronization, make sure synchronization is in space, decide how you do it. You copy as you receive, you copy after, how do you feedback it? So there's huge complexity. And we've seen same in applications. So going from mindframe to VMs to container eventually. When one RU switch restarts, it's completely stateless. It will eventually learn all its derived states over routing protocol and interaction with the network. If you look at NSR, all of this happening within the box, it's stateful and very, very fragile. By the way, again, for those who don't know these terms, NSF non-stop forwarding, NSR non-stop routing, GR, graceful restart, okay? So um, what we did was, we back to the concept of, okay, it would be cool if we had, you know, one big chassis or one big network switch and would connect every compute unit to it. The problem is just your, your chassis is never big enough support their entire network. So uh, in, in this model, we are thinking about how to build a big switch that can cover all the network in a disaggregated form. So we, we, we borrow the same uh, chassis design to a certain extent that you, know, you have line card. Now line cards become top of rack switches or, or pizza box switches. And then you have a backplane in the chassis that you, you turn it into spine and lift, which is connectivity between those line cards um, in, in a uh, uh, non-subscribing uh, manner uh, or depending on your oversubscription that you want. And then you have intelligence inside the chassis that talks between line cards and control the traffic and communicate between them. Some of these chassis, which is, for example, use ISIS and extend TLVs to communicate between line cards and know about each other's availability and routes. In this example, you know, it's very common to use BGP uh, across those pizza box switches in a disaggregated form. Um, the, our first design was based on 3.2 terabit per second merchant silicon. It means that you, you see 3.2 uh, silicons connected with fiber optic and create a big chassis network that uh, first goal was to support 200,000 bare metal servers. So we needed to scale it to 64 pod in three tiers, which is top of rack, leaf, and spine. We're going to talk about it. Uh, and we agreed in the design that at the top of rack stage, we're okay with one to three over subscription. Um, but also it enables you to, to scale horizontally and add to capacity because one thing that you can do, you can add more fabric switches, more pizza box switches as your network grows, so that you don't need to invest in a huge fabric from day one. As you build more pods, you can increase this going forward. Um, the, the other thing was, we talked about it, the, the moving services from appliances such as core switches, firewall appliances and load balances or other type of you know, black boxes um uh, moving those services to the code to the x86 
enable us to move much faster. And we don't need to really think about what kind of a specific three-phase power I need in this suite so that I can, I can accommodate this big chassis or what kind of you know cooling I need. The network becomes very uh, flat and unified that you don't need to think about how you're going to build your, your real estate around uh, the properties of bigger chassis or bigger cabinets. We can certainly you move on to, to mm -hmm. sure, uh, how we, I, I had some slide about, you know, how, how you create this, because I, I get this uh, question about how you you scale your network with uh, only three tier. It, it really depends on how many bare metals you want to, to support. In this example, I have in the next slide and series of a slide, we're talking about how to design a disaggregated packet switch network. Probably comments coming to me late. That's why I don't see those. Uh, when I see the new comments, I will choose some of them and then, and then we will also talk about them. So, Sean, uh, given that we probably on one third of the slides, would it make sense to stop somewhere on the half and uh, restart maybe next week? Because I think people, it's a great discussion. You bring so much interesting exactly. perspective on it and you are doing it it's not like you read somewhere else about it right yeah. and uh most people kind That's of good. counting to one hour to 90 minutes mm -hmm. given where we are i would count it's going to take more than two hours to the progress should we stop in about 15 20 minutes and reconvene in a week or two would that work for you uh, yeah absolutely makes sense okay okay let's continue um all right, so in, in this example, we have 100,000 bare metal servers. How, how do we know that? Well, it's you when you're building a data center, you have some idea about what you want to accomplish. You get a property or real estate, you get some energy in terms of power. For example, you can secure 10 megawatts uh, of power in that building. And then you think about, okay, I, I want this many cabinets and the power budget for servers in 10 megawatt i can i can put like 100,000 or 150,000 uh bare metal servers there so then you build your infrastructure on top of that so in this example for 100,000 servers you calculate you want to give 48 port or 96 per cabinet so you, you need some top of rack switches the number here based on that is 2048 top of rack switches you're going to need um then we move to the next tier, the, the, the leaf and the spine uh, in the next slide are created just to support this connectivity together in an unblocking fashion. So based on that, uh, you, you, you're going to need 256 uh, leaf nodes if you want to give them, you know, 64 port of 100 gig um, to those access switches based on your traffic calculation. And then we move to the next slide, which calculates you need 128 spine switches. In this design, because we have a four parallel fabric, you're not going to consume ports between fabrics to talk to each other. It's going to save you a lot of bandwidth. And also, it makes the traffic uh, more deterministic. That uh, longest path is always five stage away from one end to another, not more than that. Because if fabrics to the devices connect to each other, then uh, you, you're going to have different behaviors when they uh, route the traffic between uh, leaf and spine. Moving to the next one, it, it, it's a basic calculation of how the fabric's going to look like. They are disjointed. They are not connected to each other. The only place that actually they are connected is from the edge, from the top of racks, which is in this topology, which we, we call it um, disjointed fat tree or um, butterfly um, or, or, or clone networks. This is technically four clone networks in parallel. And um, I think next slide, we're color coding them. So each fabric is called the plane. Each plane has its own color and works independently from the other one. And the next slide shows the connectivity across the data center fabric with 2048 switches plus 256 plus 128 is required. Uh, which is 2,400 switches to support 100,000 bare metal servers. And these are pizza box switches, which we have. Uh, there are specifics in the next slide. 
So if you want to simplify it from one tour to another, from one cabinet to another, one server can talk to the other server through the tour. In this design, we have a single tour and there are four, four ECMP paths between the tours. It could be, you know, any number 18, 16, 32, 64, and so forth, depending on your design. This so important point to remember you... here. Oh. Go ahead, Please continue. I'll. Uh... You, you, you can independently maintain, upgrade, or tweak these fabrics because they are not necessarily connected to each other. So it's, it's, it's good in terms of migration or maintenance. You have different uh, false domains and control. So no, no shunt link, no direct connectivity, et cetera, with them. Right. Yeah, so when you leave tour, you already decide which plane you are going to take. There's no way you can leave your plane somewhere in between. So tour will use internal hashing to decide which link to take. Usually planes are implemented in the same way. So there's a CNP puzzles between every two endpoints in the network. This gives you ability to as John said, independently upgrade or change one of the planes, give you ability to add more planes if you need. So you would just need another point of connectivity from Tor into the fabric. It's a very scalable way to, on one way to increase your capacity without affecting functionality. On another side, it reduces your blast radius and give you very predictable degradation if something goes wrong. So in this case, you lose exactly one force of capacity, not more, not less. By the way, Sean, question. So you have here symmetric topology. Each link is same capacity basically between leaf and spine or top of rectal leaf. So that's why you have ECMP, but um, uh, are you running uh, phase three out here? You don't need, right? Yeah, we don't run faster routes in, in terms of having a, a loop-free alternate sitting there and trigger it when something happens. The, the convergence in this network, because it's all EVGP, is being mostly handled by activity of link. So you detect your neighbor, you know, goes off with fiber optic down most of the times. There are some, you know, other cases. And switch can easily move, remove that next hop from the ECMP group and continue that ECM group, ECMP group with the uh, neighbors that are available. And um, hash again. That's so this is a classical example to use fast rehash versus fast route. You've got number of ECMP paths, you create in direction in hardware. If you observe BFD going down a loss of signal or a loss of optic, you just remove this particular physical entity from the ECMP array and rehash the traffic. There's no need for control plane to do any additional calculation. It's a CMP. Every pass is loop free per definition. Right. By the way, That's about, the great about, thing about BGP, right? Because you can abstract and isolate the state at each stage. So you can easily scale it. This side of the network doesn't need the specifics of the other side. BGP takes care of it simply and abstract all of this information. It just handles the next hops. I collected this question. It's uh, relevant now. So another question, DC networks of cloud giants are still about VX and EVPN. Are there plans to use the services? In fact, we will talk about the services, not probably this week, uh, but Sean, what do you want to say for this one now? Uh, many of these technologies, uh, whether you know they, they, they are good or bad for your use cases, rely on the hardware support. Now, um, VXLAN is implemented for many years in the hardware with different uh, merchant silicons. Uh, SRV6 is a little bit more complex in terms of implementation because it sits inside the, the IP header. So some you know, silicon require more uh, lookup and uh, 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 more advanced features in order to be able to handle it or change it or move the pointer. But those, those capabilities are, uh, Inovium is one of those silicons that actually support SRV6 now. Uh, but it's still a little bit too early for for wide implementation of a service in the network. One thing that they can do with a service is that make it completely transparent from the network, um, so that you know end host can talk about it, but network is not. But you lose some of the cool things about the service that you can you know go through different paths. We're going to talk about it more uh, in next slides. So practically, if you look at large hyperscalers 
no one is using EVP on their control plane. Uh, to my knowledge, everybody is using their own encapsulations. That might look somewhat like VXLAN, actually better than VXLAN because VXLAN was meant for layer two. But what you see in traditional enterprise is not necessarily what you're going to see in hyperscale data center. But uh, still, we will discuss uh, why they don't have EVP and uh, their, about their plan for the SRB6, et cetera, guys. There are many interesting things coming. I seen this slide deck, by the way, uh, earlier. By the way, we will, we will share this uh, slide deck with you if you like this video. And uh, also, if you share this uh, next week or maybe two weeks later, we will discuss when we, we will do the next one. But next one, uh, if you are really, uh, interested and in how we will see this like video. Okay, what is this? So uh, in probably five minutes we can we can finish today's session. So sure. yeah. So let's sure. decide uh, where you think it would be logically okay to. I, th stop. I think for okay. thank you for interest of time uh, and given that we have five minutes, uh, it would be great to talk about five next slide quickly, which talks about you know the hardware block, and then we can cut it at software defined network or that programmability feature for for the next session the the first generation we we, we came up with this uh, odm switches that you can customize from the uh, variety of different manufacturers they produce the switch for you based on your custom uh, uh, specification and then you put um how much you know cpu do you want what kind of memory space do you need there and then what kind of silicon you want to use and that is what, what ODM uh, provide. Some of these ODMs are actually producing switches for, for OEMs. Um, so the building uh, block that we came up with was this pizza box switch that has 3.2 terabit per second capacity. It has 32 cores of 100 gig, which we can split it to you know 10 gig, 25 gig, multiple 25 gigs, and, or, or 250 gig per port. Um, we, we decided to no, not go with chassis switches due to the discussion that we had. And uh, the, the decision around switches was was really simple because we don't really expect a lot of things like FCOE, VXLAN, EVPN, MC lag, those kind of things is pure basic IPv4, IPv6 routing uh, on a Linux environment. So moving on, we have the um, the, the reason to own the code and the switch, we talked about a little bit freedom and being able to move fast was the most important thing. Then in the end came the cost that you know, it became way cheaper because you don't have to you know pay the license for BGP or other protocols which are easy to you know access in um, using anything like Quago or Bird or uh, FRR, which is free range routing uh, project. And uh, gives us, you know, more control and independence in terms of uh, our, our investment in the in the software space. Moving on, we we, we talk about the building block on the software. We started with Open Switch uh, project internally at LinkedIn, and then we pivoted to to Sonic, which is the operating system first um, introduced by Microsoft, and it's, it's it has open community, and anybody can contribute to it. Uh, one of the good things that Sonic has is built on top of something called Psi, which provides abs good abstraction layer interface for silicon. So you can bring, you know, Broadcom or Innovium without really changing anything in your operating system. They're just like device drivers and everything, you know, um, supposed to work out of the box. So you, 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 the idea was that we're gonna have this uniform software across the board in the data center, and then you're gonna have this ability to changing silicon without really changing anything in our software team. So we can have this uniform SKU of hardware and software with minimum feature set that is relevant to, to us, which is V4 and V6 routing, nothing you know fancy other than network is just a bunch of Linux intermediate hosts that are speaking routing language to each other. And then because we have you know, this uh, huge bare metal implementation based on Linux, we can use the same tools and automation that you use on servers, use it for your um, network switches because they are just Linux with more interfaces. 
short comment here. So Sonic traditionally has been run by Microsoft, who actually used to own it completely, and number of hyperscalers, you know, LinkedIn, which is part of Microsoft, and uh, similar companies. There are a number of companies in China who use Sonic. What you are going to see very soon is completely enterprise-focused Sonic releases with MCLAC, with EVP, and then all the complexity we described that's not needed in hyperscalers. So if you are an enterprise, watch Sonic Space. A lot of good stuff is coming. And we, we observe a huge traction in Sonic space, even um, uh, mostly from vendors that they want to bring their own chipset and they, they have a ready you know, operating system that they can easily integrate and give it to their customers. Moving on to the next slide, we have two more, which um, talks about um, the same thing that we already talked about. Top, how how going to top of rack switch going to look like in the first design? It was the same box, same SQ of hardware. It has 3.2 terabit per second merchant silicon uh, inside it. It can you can have 32 port of 100 gig to support you know to, to have the full capacity of 3.2 terabit per second, or you can split those 100 gig ports to 50 gig. Then you have 64 port of 50, or you can split those you know 32 ports to 425 or 410 gig, which you can connect your servers and you can have more interfaces. What sure. we needed was 48 of 25 gig and four offerings of 100 gig to connect to those fabrics. For example, medium scale, uh, they say, data centers, what would be the number of top of rack switches like this? Are we talking about 1,000 to 5,000, 10,000 or 100,000? Can you give some numbers? For that? Uh, mi middle scale, excluding the top five giants, uh, probably somewhere around 10,000 switches in a DC. We are talking about uh, your scale, right? Yeah. Right. So, right. the er, interesting er, point er, er, here, er. what you see is Trident to switch, right? It's just six years since it had been released and implemented in Falco. Today, we are shipping 24 terabit silicon. Can you imagine going from 3.2 terabit to 24? Terra in just six years. It's kind of, it's an amazing number. It's an insane number if you think about number of packets, amount of innovation and engineering that went to. So networking is really outdoing any development in CPUs, in GPUs that's happening. We are going as fast as we can networking and today you would be deploying at least 12 Terra switches with if you're large enough, spines doing 24 this year, next year. Absolutely, and that's one of the things that networking is outpacing as well as security as well, which you don't have time to, you know, look at the payload in a transit anymore. You have to trans send the packets as fast as possible. Um, moving to the next one, uh, it is the same SQ of hardware, but in new generation, we upgraded this to 12.8 um, Inovium-based chipset. Uh, it, uh, or in older generation, we had the Broadcom uh, Tomahawk, which provides you know, 3.2, and they, they, they came up with also the new generation, which is 12.8 and 25.6, which is the newer one. That's why you uh, said with your chipset SRV6 is there. That, that was extremely important to us to have that capability, obviously, yes. Uh, and, and the other part of it is that since we're talking about leaf and spine, which is in the picture shows that, you know, that, that arrow, that the second and third tier, then in order, if you want to provide one-to-one -one subscription, it means that you, you, you can intake as much as traffic and you can process it and send it over. Um, you, you need to split this middle tier. Middle tier is in this picture leaf into some ports gonna go down to top of rack and some ports gonna go, 50% of them gonna go up to the next stage so that you have equal number of ports for incoming versus outgoing traffic, depending on how you look at the traffic direction. And that, that part can be done through, how many ports do you need for the spine? can scale out throughout based on your traffic pattern or number of pods. So you don't need to build a huge spine cluster. You can 
you can add to that capacity as you go. So you will consume, you know, more ports and bring more spine switches. Hence, you provide more bandwidth to your uh, network. So there, there are two simple ways to provide more bandwidth to your network. One of them is investing in this building block, getting a 12.8 or 25.6 or larger pizza box with silicon, or having more of these and have more ECMP, which we use kind of, you know, both of those strategies, having more parallel links and more fabrics, as well as uh, upgrading the fabric layer to, to the latest one so that we can uh, process the data as fast as possible. With that, I think we're good. We can put this stuff um, in the software layer, which is next slide. Okay. Okay. Well, so let's stop here and uh, probably discuss some points you mentioned. So I think as we go to 400 gig in the data center, it's very important to understand whether you go faster or wider. And uh, looking at a lot of research and actually what happened in Facebook, at least it was public in uh, F16 project, we see people going wider. And there are reason for that. We are in a CMP network. So the more the wider the uh, radix, the better load sharing becomes, given you've got many flows. Uh, from uh, Blast Radius perspective, it's cheaper to lose 100 gig than 400 gig. So it's very important consideration, especially if you run at high speeds, whether you go 400 gig or maybe split it in four times 100 and go with wider radix. But also, let's not forget but how many racks you need to place in a, a single DC is limited and uh, more probably bigger and bigger data centers you will need in that uh, approach. So another architectural choice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So guys, this week we started with the, uh, so far as you can see, just we could describe the hardware and physical aspect, we can say, but uh, next week or next session, let's say, uh, live session again, you can join and we will continue with data center, but this time uh, software, control plane, those kind of things we will discuss, SRV6, also why we don't have EVPN or NCLAG and those kind of fancy service layer stuff. Uh, please, if you like this, if you found it useful, uh, like this video and follow the uh, updates. I, please uh, follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter because we are also sharing the uh, links for joining the next section dash, or an argument, LinkedIn or an argument. Uh, Twitter. Also, Sean, uh, how people can reach out to you? So you are using, I think, LinkedIn also. L LinkedIn will be the best, yes, and easiest. Obviously, LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, Jeff, how people can reach out to you? Uh, either Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, so, guys, please keep on asking questions. We would love to answer the questions, uh, and Sean will answer the questions as well. So, please be active and don't be shy. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. And we are going to continue in very, very short time. So week two or so. Depends yes. on your availability, really. Thanks, Sean. Bye. Guys. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good day.